Yeah. And, you know, although you are uh, right that I probably have experienced something like this, I just haven't realized it. This is the first time that I became consciously aware of the experience that was there. And Mm -hmm. something that I noticed was that a few seconds into the the whole experience, my brain started trying to understand it. And then it kind of started fading away. And since Mm -hmm. then, my brain has been trying to kind of make that experience into a part of my ego. I can feel it keeps on like trying to go back to it. You think that's a wise thing to do? I mean, I don't think so, but, you know, if there was like an off switch for my brain, I I would, I would click the switch, but. Uh, That's called death. (laughs) Well, well, I feel like the best I can do, well, not the best I can do, but Mm -hmm. the, the most mindful thing I can do is simply to observe the thoughts as they come up. Ah, yes. The old, good old, tried and true Mahasi method. Yeah. But okay. with that being said, I do feel like, you know, this is a, a level that I have never reached before in my sis. And it, it almost <laughs> felt like kind of a shift. All right. What if it shifts back? Well... It, it kind of has, you know. But, <laughs> okay. But it's just like, it's, it's almost like that, that awareness is still there in, in the back of my head almost. How about the memory of it is still there in the back of your mind? That, that also may very well be a possibility. Okay. And that you visit that memory with mind moments from time to time. In other words, you remember it. And when you remember it, sometimes we remember it with wow, and sometimes we remember it with i got to have that again. Yeah. I mean, I'm not really worried about having it again because I know that wanting to recreate that experience is within itself a desire and a hindrance. And okay, so what what about something like uh, in the frame of reference that I got along without it before I had it, I could get along without it now? Well, exactly. Okay. Just for me, for a long time, uh, like a big majority of my journey was chasing the experience, considering that you know i got into somehow all... that's very western yeah chasing yeah. things and so we wind up chasing experiences in meditation because that's about the only thing that we'll find <laughs> uh, well my reason for that was <laughs> because uh you know psychedelics were actually what got me into this all this what led to where i am today and as you Let us say when you were taking the psychedelics or even before you took them, before you took them, you were doing something else. And before you were doing that, you were doing something else. And all the while, from whatever it was to the next step, into the psychedelics, into the meditation, all along the way, you wanted something. Mm Mm-hmm. And one thing led to another, but one is not a gateway to the other. The gateway is the, or the gate is the wanting. Yeah, now you're right. Yes, I know. Been there, done that. (laughs) Human minds work that way. Yeah, that's what I keep telling people. We all have the same computer. We just put our own different programs onto them. Right, exactly. And those programs are normally put in there in childhood. Yeah. When we're not actually quite so, um, let us say, skilled at figuring out which programs we want to run. 
that in fact that's exactly what happens is is that Windows wants to bring you all of the software that you need and you'll just stay there without learning anything. And a lot of people find out about Chrome anyway. And other people figure uh, find out about more than 10 browsers available because <laughs> you use Google Chrome or uh, Google to go find out what all kind of browsers there are. And Microsoft keeps wondering, why don't people play the ones that they were given when they got a baby Windows? Time change. The, the church has asked the same question. So anyway, yes, we can figure out that a lot of the programming, including wanting something or being dissatisfied in general, and basically what that actually means is, is that we actually need to see dukkha enough to want to be able to get out of it, to get on the spiritual journey anyway. And then the more we go, the better adept that we get at seeing dukkha. The question is, are we going to uh, uh, to see that pile of shit and step around it? Or are we going to pick it up and rub it all, all over our bodies mentally, of course? And the answer is, that's what the Mahasi method teaches. So if I am understanding you correctly, having that experience, given my previous conditioning, has actually brought Dukkha into my life in the form of wanting to re-experience that same thing. Exactly. Ever since you've had it, you you put some importance on it, whether then recognize, oh, that's just another moment. We've got another one coming by. Let's not cling to the past. It's over. Because I can actually like see that as you're saying it in real time. Like, I can <laughs> see my brain holding on to the desire subconsciously to want to experience it again. Mm -hmm. And to be able to see that as dukkha. Uh huh. Because we want it or actually, actually the that's let me be very clear about that so that you can see the sequence. The dukkha is the result of first you had the experience. It contacted you. You had a feeling of really liking it. And as it began to fade away, you wanted to cling to it and it didn't and it went away anyway. And now you're stuck into clinging to something that you don't have, that you didn't even you know existed until you had it, and there it's gone. And now you want it back again. That's where the, the dukkha dukkha. starts. That's the dukkha. Not that you had it, not that you liked it, not that you were holding it, but that uh, you lost, lost it. it. And you yeah. still wanted it. And now you're in the state of the dukkha, which is wanting something you don't have. And if you can wake up to that, you can then enjoy the, those events when they come by and when they're gone, let them go. You'll have another one soon enough. When you get yourself in the right state of mind, which is actually the way that you get into those things is when you don't want anything and you can relax. Wow, everything is so fine. And then all of a sudden things get really nice. And, you know, that's actually exactly how it happened the first time, too. <laughs> I was in the anything. book. <laughs> huh? It's in the book. <laughs> or more specifically, it's in the sutras. Yeah, but you see, that's why it also it gave me kind of a, a good feeling knowing that I was doing something right because mm -hmm. that experience came up. You know, it was almost as if I wasn't even paying attention to what was going on simply because I was so deep in the present moment. And, you know, I wouldn't use the word deep. Well, yeah. So just How so about pleasant. sitting comfortably? Digging and deep has the quality of working very hard and shoveling dirt. All right, so let's just say <laughs> I was so present. Okay, well, not so present, just present. Yeah, just present. But there's no need to have a lot of superlatives to it. 
just another ordinary experience. And you can have that experience or any other experience you want. You're freely available. No, I know. I guess it was, it was just nice to me because you if know, you these... have the skills, they're presently available. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it was just nice to me because it was almost as if my, my experience had come. What's so funny? Oh. Uh... Ticks, <laughs> the dog, she's sitting here wanting me to pick the ticks off of her. And so I'm doing that and pulling them out. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but I'm really paying attention to what you're saying. I've just got another, yet another. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. No, but I just, uh, you know, I really liked how it, it almost, it felt like it came full circle because you know, usually these are the type of experiences that I would only have under under the influence of a psychedelic. And, you know, this time it was completely natural. Well, it's not the psychedelic. It's that when the psychedelic chemicals are in the mind, there's partly what's called letting go. Yeah. But some people take psychedelics and really fight them and resist them. Yeah, I mean... You know, when I would take them, I would just, I would take them simply for the purpose of giving into the experience. And mm -hmm. because of that, I was able to. Well, now you can do that with this present way. moment and just give into the experience. This present exactly. Age, put it and <laughs> the fact that I'm able to do that and that I've realized that I'm able to do that now simply by being present. It's, it's like a lovely thing for me, honestly. Well, that's the whole point. That's the gladdening of the mind so that you can see that it actually is quite pleasant to be here now. Yeah, exactly. As opposed, for instance, of worrying about all the stuff that we've got to do. No, no, I'm, I'm far past that. <laughs> There's no worrying here. <laughs> all right. Well, that's what we have to say then about experiences is that any and every moment that we are present that not only is an opportunity it is an experience mm -hmm. and all the time that in fact we're not present and seeing what's going on we're not experiencing anything other than our own memories at nah, the mind mm -hmm. Right. Now, um, in this regard, what we can say is you've you've heard that there are six senses. Mm -hmm. OK, the uh, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the touch, all all of that, plus the mind. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, sometimes uh, Westerners get the idea. That uh, one is good and one is bad or that one's more important than the other. But basically what happens is, is that we, uh, when we start off in practice, we spun off, start off with most of the mind moments in the mind door to consciousness. Consciousness has all of these mind doors and it can only have, like it's a revolving door and it can only have one door open at a time, but it can spin that dial in a tenth of a second. And so what happens is, is that we go back and forth between being in the present moment and in the past. And sometimes we get really stuck in the past and going over and over and over and over something and spending a lot of mind moments thinking about in the past. And then we get into the habit of doing that. If we want something, if we're worried about something, if we're confused about something, if we're just tired, it happens. The mind just starts almost as if the car is in idle, but the motor is still running. Yeah, because that's what it's supposed to do. It'll just grab anything it can and feed on it. Exactly so. All right. So these are the hindrances. I just gave them actually in the order with the rest of the and uh, up <laughs> and and uh, wanting things that we don't have and uncomfortable and all of that kind of stuff. 
There, these are hindrances simply because it prevents us from being in whatever state that we want to be in and puts us into a state that we don't want to be in. That we're hindered from being what we could be or who we are in this present moment because there's a hindrance in the mind. And so the whole practice of Anapanasati is wake up to these hindrances, wake up to the fact that we're not in feeling as good as we want to feel. We're dissatisfied when we could be satisfied, and all we have to do is change the attitude a little bit at a time, change the way that we feel. Put awareness on the dissatisfaction. Well, only long enough to see it, Mm -hmm. and then drop it with a gladdening thought. See, the Mahasi method, they want you to see it and look at it and take a good look at it and see this association with that dukkha. And so you go down a whole stream of dukkha, one after another, down a rat hole of dukkha. But then there's some sort of dark night of the dukkha in there someplace, I've heard. But the whole point is, is that the teaching of the Buddha, the Anapanasati, is only see dukkha as dukkha because you're an expert at seeing it. Yeah. Catch it quick. Look at it, recognize it for what it is, and don't go there. And honestly, I think this conversation will help me with that a lot because, you know, once you mentioned how that that wanting to experience it again was dukkha, I had been able to catch the dukkha in such a subtle form that I'd never been able to before. You know, I I guess I, I used to think that before, in order for it to be dukkha, it had to be this this large, grand, huge emotion completely blocking up your mind. I, I don't know, it was so subtle that, you know, seeing, hearing those words made me kind of grasp onto the subtleties of it. Yes, this thought that we're having is, um, there's a really in, uh, interesting way of looking at it, and that is is that we have a standards setting mechanism inside about how things should be. And we've been developing that our whole lives, and a lot of it's got st- established uh, when we were kids. Mm-hmm. But what happens like this is, is that when we have a great big event, Then we set a new standard. Oh, now that's your new standard. You're supposed to do that. Right? And and basically what the real teaching is, is to look at this standard setting. Because we're constantly setting ourselves up for failure by setting standards too high. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. And so people work really hard to live up to their supposed to's. Instead of just enjoying the moment. And so you built a new supposed to. Once you've had an experience, you're supposed to be able to get it again. And now it's a rule rather than, an, um, let us say, a relaxation. <laughs> and so these are the subtle workings of the mind. And this is what the Buddha is look is talking about in the sense of right investigation or sama area ditti, right viewing. Look at this stuff. Moment mind moment by mind moment. And then taking the effort to change that into a wholesome thought, a gladdening the mind. Aha, I see you, Myra. Uh Uh-huh, I see I want to repeat uh, an old experience. But this one's But the experience of this, but this one's good enough. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's the whole quality of satisfaction is to be satisfied when you don't have a whoop-de-doo. And that satisfaction is the whoop de do within itself. Ah, yes, that's the secret. Because that we go around thinking that the whoop de do is going to give us satisfaction. And so we go after whoop de doos when, in fact, the real whoop de do is being satisfied without whoop de doos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dom Murado.
I'm just following the suttas. I mean, it's right there in the Anapanasati Sutta and other places. You're very right. Mm -hmm. That's the it's... sukha, which is just the opposite of dukkha. And we have to talk ourselves into saying it's okay. And then we begin to see it's okay and recognize that it's okay. And then what a relief it is that everything is okay. You're absolutely right. We really have to get it in that feeling system. We really do have to talk ourselves into it because the hindrances are going to consistently talk you out of it. You have, in fact, been talking yourself out of feeling good your whole life, and now it's time to talk yourself mm -hmm. into feeling good. Yeah, recondition the mind, reprogram mm -hmm. the computer. Reprogram the computer. Yeah, no, I know. You're exactly right. And uh, and here's the thing. I mean, I've seen this happen, is, is that you replace the software, the new edition is there, and it behaves exactly the way that the old software does. And you go figure it out and find out, oh, yeah, well, we didn't really get rid of the old package. It's still there, and it takes control. And so we make sure that we wipe it out. We wipe both of them out. We reload it, and now it will work. But we have to piddle with it for a while to recognize, oh, we thought we got rid of it, but no, it's still there. <laughs> yeah, I'm currently in the process of cleaning out my hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, so no. that's that that's really all there is to it is is that really that experience you had there was nothing to it yeah it doesn't even exist anymore doesn't exist anymore and when it did you you uh, enjoyed it for a little while i mean shit i experienced it yeah <laughs> so remember how you felt I mean, I don't really feel anything, honestly. Anymore. Well, when you had that experience, what's the point of having an experience if you don't experience it? And when you did experience it, it touched you. How did you feel when that experience touched you? I felt enlightened. All right. Well, now <laughs> you do again. I just mentioned it, and here you go. Okay, so go with the ex go with the feeling, not with. Because you can, you remember the feeling and you bring it back. Oh, yeah, I know how good that feels. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. You know, I'm feeling yeah, I, I'm feeling right now. Yeah, okay. So this is the point as you're learning to, uh, to recognize, number one, that you can control your feelings. And number two, you're beginning to recognize that there's a process or pattern whereby we can learn to do that so that you can begin to feel the way you want to feel rather than feeling the way that your instincts tell you to feel or my experiences tell me to feel ah but those experiences you put a set of rules against and measure them up to see this and in fact it's your rule keeping not the actual experience my perception of the experience that tells me how to precisely, feel. Precisely, precisely, your perception of the experience <laughs> tells you how to feel about it. This is right there in Petitya Sabupada. That's it. Your perceptions, based upon your past, tell you how, uh, what kind of, uh, how to feel about what you're seeing. Or basically how to color what you're seeing so that the colored version of what contacts you will then determine how you feel. Hmm. The Buddha figured this out 2,500 years ago when humans haven't changed, not an inch. That's what blows my mind the most. <laughs> like the fact that I've had to like dig so far deep and like reteach myself everything I thought to be true. And like this information was already like known and stuff. <laughs> like, like I can almost imagine how different of a world we would be living in if everyone knew this if nobody not, were, we're, don't even plan on everybody doing this it starts with the joke of well what if everybody ordained and became a Buddhist monk or nun we wouldn't have any more babies 
Yeah. That's the logical extension or the crazy part of it. The answer to that is, hey, there are too many people that are all hung up about sexuality. They may not even spend a day in the what <laughs> before they take those robes off to get into the brothel. And where and who's and who's populating the brothel on the other side of the of the business, other than the nuns <laughs> who just le left in the darkness the what that they were in. So no, you don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. There will always be a large population of ordinary people doing ordinary things, living an ordinary life of uh, the second noble truth running their lives. They don't want to wake up, and when they do wake up, they blame somebody else for it. That's what psychological projections and all of that kind of stuff is all about. That's the normal NPC programming. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably the most uh, interesting and funny example of that is Donald Trump, who <laughs> knows everything he does that is um, crooked, wrong, harms people, he could get into trouble for. He will then take that one at a time and find somebody out there and blame them saying that's what they do. It's almost conscious projection. It, it's almost like he knows what he's doing. Yeah. It's part of, the, part of the charlatan's game. Yeah, they're it's, all it's, very aware of what they're doing there. Mm-hmm on a level but what they don't understand is is doing that kind of stuff is harming themselves yeah, probably they more don't than they understand is it's not really even that <clears throat> it's just right. the, the pain body and the ego acting through them because they're not aware of what it is uh-huh and if someone like you or i go and talk to them about it how long are they going to listen to that oh not at all because okay now tolerate the presence Exactly. So we could say it like this. You're thinking about like building a huge, huge army of uh, wise people. You're going to draft them into this army and train them in this army, whether they like it or not. And they're going to have to go into whatever we're referring to as a battle with whatever armor and skills they have to defeat some enemy. This is the idea. All right. The whole point is, is that the Buddha Dhamma is much more like the Marines. We only want a few good men because we know that there's going to be a few good men who don't want to get drafted because they want something better. All right. And then, in fact, our society has a draft. And that real Dhamma dudes are draft dodgers. We're driving, we're dodging the draft. What is the draft? It's the news. It's the politics. It's the, you got to work for a living. You don't work, you don't eat. There's a whole long stuff that um, happens when over the many p years, I mean, that's what um, grammar school through high school into college, that whole education system is educating the child into how to sign up for the draft. Yeah. In fact, they've already been drafted. Every year they're drafted next level and next level and next level. And so it, we as kids go along to get along. We do what we're told to do, expecting and hoping for a result that's far out in the future that never comes. <laughs> And I've got a lot of stories about that. No, I'm sure you do. Mostly about the fact that we are draft animals and we don't know it. That's what the Buddha talks about, the woeful state of being reborn as an animal. Because we're reborn as, say, a horse that lives in a pasture. But he's got all kinds of beautiful things to eat in this marvelous pasture. And the farmer comes along and he harnesses that horse to a plow. It forces the, the horse to plow up his pasture so that the farmer can plant food he wants and the horse is left with hay. Now, is that the life of every child? I mean, more or less. More or less, exactly. 
And that's why we spend so much time in that woeful state of just going along to get along, doing what we're told to do. And why it's so dangerous for some of us to become whistleblowers. Going around saying, wakey, wakey, folks. There's a whole lot yeah. of people want to keep all of those people quiet. Don't yeah, want them to know. Most people don't want to hear the whistle either. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so you don't have to worry about getting a massive army. You just want to know those who have the ability to listen to, let us say, a Dhamma whistle. Congratulations, yeah, you're, you're listening. <laughs> no, I know, I know. You're right. It's just, I, I mean, I, I guess there's nothing left to say, but <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, there is this one thing then, and that is learn to whistle while you work. I've, I've been doing that. All right. Well, see, that's the whole point, that if you're whistling while you work, that means that you're enjoying what you're doing. You're not the dumb animal that's going along to getting along. You're actually in the present moment, enjoying this present moment, and things get done. Yeah, exactly. And while you're whistling, while you work, that's the Dhamma whistle, and other people may be able to hear, them. oh, what's that? That's a no, sweet I, I got some people <laughs> around me hearing the whistle. <laughs> well, no. congratulations, Ron. That's good. Yes, yeah. that's what we're all about, is, is that when we start hearing how, how marvelous the Dhamma is, we start whistling that tune. Yeah, no, I've told some of my friends about it. Actually, yeah. I, I had one of them join one of the, the Sangha chats because he was interested and he wanted to know more. I've, I have been spreading the word to, you know, whoever will listen. Yeah, because I know most people don't want to hear it, but for those that do, you know, mm -hmm. it would be rude of me almost to, to keep this wisdom to myself. Yeah, it's actually hard. This is what Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa actually refers to when he says the duty to the Dhamma. The duty when we're meeting our duty to the Dhamma is when we're spreading it enthusiastically. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I just, you know, everyone's a reflection of myself. And why mm -hmm. would I not want everyone that I can to experience or not even experience, but just get this joy from experience and whatever it may be. Yes, so that's the whole point about these Skype calls is so that we can all have a party. I spread the Dharma. Spread the Dharma. Whistle while I work. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ron, this is, let me cut this one out short now and uh, congratulate you again for being able to get over yet another experience because you've got a lot of them coming. Yeah. Don't cling I mean, to the old ones. You got some new ones. You ain't seen nothing yet, as the joke goes. You know that um, joke. When they come, they come for now. I'm by just now, enjoying myself. One by one as they occur, so the sutta says. One by one as they occur. Look at what's uh -huh. going on. Well, I'm ready. All right. That's right. Congratulations, you're up for it. You're up for the task. I'm not just up for it. I'm <laughs> I'm enthusiastic about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, jump right in. The stream is yours. All right. Thank you so much, John Murata. See ya. I'll see you.